Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, get out your King James Bibles. We're going to do another Acknowledge Him in All Thy Ways. Aaron, part three. We've had three times where Aaron, you know, Aaron's the one that seemed to have the most parts. But we'll see as we keep going through. We might come across other men in the Bible that have more times where they fail to acknowledge God, and here's why. Okay, but we're going to do Aaron, part three. So get out your King James Bible and uh, turn to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Before we get started, I wanted to sing a hymn, if we can sing a hymn together. Um, look, you can look up, To God Be the Glory. An old hymn, To God Be the Glory. Right. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be Our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offenders who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. I chose this hymn, Brothers of Christ, for two reasons. We're going to get into this study about respect of persons, okay? And it's God that deserves all the glory. We're supposed to be giving God all the glory, not man. We're supposed to be lifting Jesus Christ up, not lifting men up and making them equal or higher than Jesus Christ. So that's one of the reasons. The other reasons I like this song, it says, Through Jesus, the Son, capital S Son, okay? Through the Son. Jesus is called Son of God, Son of Man, Son of David, but nowhere in Scripture is He ever called God the Son. Now that's a whole nother, we've already had the study on it, on why is it wrong to say God the Son. The separates Jesus from God the Father and makes Him a separate God. The is definitive, it separates everything. If I have a group of vehicles out in the parking lot and I say the car or the truck, I'm talking about one specific car separating it from all the others. Now the Son of God, the word of, shows connection. We've, we've talked about this, it's a whole other study, but I like that. Jesus the Son. It's not God the Son. Okay? It's the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God the Father. Okay? But mainly for this study, to God be the glory. I've had people try to give me glory, brothers and Christ, and I always try to tell them, hey, give God the glory. Give God the glory. I don't want any glory. It's all God's. I don't want people. I don't want to. I don't want to be stealing God glory from God and giving it to myself. And I don't want brethren 
that follow this ministry to take glory from God, from me, or from God, and give it to me. Okay, I don't want that. God deserves all the glory. And as we get into this study, we're going to find out one of the ways that keeps you from trusting the Lord with all your heart and leaning not on your own understanding and, and not acknowledging God in all your ways is when you start putting a man down here on a pedestal. And that pedestal seems to get higher than this. It never does, but they treat that pedestal that that man is on, that ain't Jesus Christ, like it's higher than this. Okay? So we're going to get through the normal stuff, okay? Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And what gets in the way? And lean not on your own understanding. The world's wisdom, the world's way, the lust of the flesh. Remember Paul says, make not provision for the flesh to fill, fill the lust thereof. You're to bring every thought into subjection. You're supposed to bring the flesh into subjection, the body into subjection. Okay? What gets in the way? Your own understanding. Your flesh gets in the way. The world gets in the way. Satan and his ministers get in the way. They try to use anything but absolute truth. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When you take this, and you're truly acknowledging it, what's the evidence? Your life that you live. God's going to direct your paths and say, do this, don't do that, go over here, don't go over there. You're going to be living in the life of Christ, and your life is going to line up with this book, primarily the Pauline Epistles. But instruction in righteousness, when it comes to being holy, sanctification, all throughout the book, there's stuff to learn, which we're going to be learning today. Okay? Once again, acknowledge Webster's 1828 Dictionary, to own or to notice with particular regard. Acknowledge Him. Okay? You take this. What's the evidence again? You live in a life of Christ. In other words, you make the Lord and His way the foundation of all thy ways. This is your foundation, not this. Now, I'm talking about for me, when I go and say, like, this is supposed to be my foundation, not this. Every person out there, this number one is the number one person in your life that's always going to want to be the foundation. It's not the foundation. This is the foundation. All right? Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mayst be justified in thy sayings, and mightst overcome them when thou art judged. Let God be true, and every man a liar. They that are of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Remember that one? The one about they are of the world, therefore speak thee of the world, and the world heareth them. The world goes off their own understanding. We're supposed to go off of the Lord's word. Getting ahead of myself a little bit. Psalms 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generation. Remember, acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy paths. The counsel of the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You get that in Joshua. So what gets in the way of acknowledging the Lord in all thy ways? We'll be continuing a series of studies showing great men in the Bible and where they failed to trust the Lord and acknowledge the Lord and what got in the way of doing it. Remember 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now the perfection here is not talking about sinless perfection. The perfection here is talking about your heart being right with God. When you take this and hide it in your heart and you do your best to live God's way and line up with this book, your heart is right with God and now your heart in God's eyes is perfect. It's not talking about sinless perfection. It's talking about having a perfect heart with the Lord. We've talked about this before. But what we're talking about today is instruction in righteousness. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comforts of the Scriptures might have hope. Might have hope. Okay. So let's get into this. Let's get your King James Bibles out, if you haven't already, and turn to Numbers 21. Now, we've talked about Numbers 21 already when we did the um, Acknowledge Him in All Thy Ways, Moses. Because there was two areas where Moses failed. Okay? Uh, so we, I'm going to try to go through this and try to hit some points. But if you want to, pause the video and read Numbers 21, verse 1 through verse 13 to get caught up. Okay? While I'm trying to open my book. Because we are going to go a little bit further than we didn't go last time. Because today... We're focusing on Aaron, not Moses. Numbers 20. 
Numbers, Deuteronomy. Remember that old song about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus? It's supposed to help you learn all the Bibles in order. Numbers, Deuteronomy. So let's get to 20. Let's get to 20. Verse 20. Now, to sum it all up, real quick, just to sum up the story, Moses, there's two times where they needed water. The first time they needed water, because they're out in the desert-like area, uh, Moses was told to hit the rock, and he did. And water came out for everybody. The second time, he was told to speak to the rock, talk to it, not hit it. Moses not only hit it, but he hit it twice. And his punishment was that he couldn't go into the promised land. He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. Okay. Now, when we get into Aaron, as we're going to see here, Aaron also got in trouble. And his punishment was the same as Moses. He couldn't go into the promised land. And my first thought was, well, if you remember when they were in Egypt, uh, one of the stories in Egypt, I don't have this in my notes, but you can look it up, is when he turned the water to blood, the river of the Nile to blood, he gave the staff to Aaron, and Aaron went down and struck the water. He gave the staff to Aaron, and Aaron threw it before the Pharaoh and his, uh, his priest, and it turned to a snake. There was times that Moses would give his rod to Aaron, and Aaron would perform the miracle. Okay? It's God performing the miracle. That's what, uh, Please understand, to God be all the glory. God performed the miracle. I am so sorry, brothers to Christ. I forgot to unplug it. Okay. If it's important, they'll try to call me back later. But oftentimes it was Aaron that did the, um, the miracle, like he was the one that held the staff and everything. So first thought, I was like, maybe Moses gave Aaron the staff, and Moses told Aaron to strike the rock twice, and that's how Aaron got in trouble with them, because Aaron did the same mistake Aaron, uh, Moses did. But when you look at this... Uh, verse 10, Numbers verse 10, it says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, who's the he? Moses. Must we fetch you a rock, water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. So Moses is the one that struck the rock twice. It wasn't Aaron. So part of me is like, could have been Aaron? And God had to correct me and say, no. Moses the one struck it twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, before ye shall not, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Okay? So, we caught up on the story. They both got in trouble for this. But the question is, if you turn, jump down to verse 22, Numbers 20, verse 22, real quick because I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Numbers 20, 22, that's where we read about Aaron. What happens to Aaron? And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Who's the ye there? Moses. But once again, why is Aaron being punished? You know what I believe? Pro, let's go Proverbs 3, 5. What gets in the way of trusting God with all your heart and leaning not on your understanding and all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths? Respect our persons. Moses does this thing. Aaron knew it was wrong. He heard the command that God gave him. What did Aaron do? Well, I'm of Moses and this is the direction Moses is going, he's the great man of God, you know, I, I'm just going to have to go with it also. What if I believe that Aaron's problem was? Respect her persons. 
He put someone down here above God Almighty. And I've heard that a lot in ministries where this, I, I think Peter Ruckman has one of my favorite studies where he's defend, just it's not a Bible study, it's more of him just talking about what he's had to go through when it comes to defending the Word of God with the Bible perversionist. And he was telling a story where he was talking, somebody was telling, a young man was telling two elderly men that were in ministry, he was showing them mistakes in one of the Bible perversions, and one of the comments that were made was, is so-and-so is, is our captain, so we're going to follow him. And the young man says, I thought Jesus was the captain of our salvation. What was Aaron's problem? He started elevating Moses above the Lord God Almighty. Okay? So we're going to get into this. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not of thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What happened to Aaron? He, he got punished and he couldn't go into the promised land. Why? Respecter of persons. And I see this a lot today. And I'm going to try to use, we're going to use some examples in the Bible of other men that made the same mistake. But I'm also going to be talking about a couple real world examples to really bring it home. Okay. So what got in the way of Aaron acknowledging the Lord in all his way? Respecter of persons. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.10. We're going to be turning some places where I'm going to be physically turning, but once again, to keep these videos short as I can, I love scripture, I love tons of scripture. Pause the video, turn to it, and then you can unpause the video. But 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Now, I always got to kick this, because this is not mainly for this study, but Watch out for preachers out there that keep pushing. There are things we can, when it comes to the Word of God, there's things that we can agree to disagree on. That's wrong. That's a false teaching. Now, we don't have to have the same favorite color, or favorite fruit, or favorite vegetable. We don't all have to agree when it comes to worldly things. But when we say, thus saith the Lord, we're all supposed to be on the same page. We're all supposed to be of the same mind. Speak the same things that there be no division among you. What causes division? What's one of the biggest causes in the division in the body of Christ today? Well, the flesh, but I'm talking about the body of Christ, not the world. The body of Christ. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Same mind, same judgment. What gets in the way? Right here, verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. Contentions? What's causing the contentions? Verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. That last one's right. And I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Brothers of Christ, this is the final authority. What causes the most division in the body of Christ that I see today, especially on YouTube, on video platforms, but YouTube, is because this isn't your final authority. This is whatever man you're following is. And that's going to cause division because as men that are flawed, because I'm still in a wicked body of flesh, I'm not perfect, I'm saved, I'm sealed into the day of redemption, I know where I'm going when I die. You know, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. But I'm still in this wicked body of flesh. I'm still have to being tempted by the flesh, I'm still being tempted by the world, I'm being attacked a lot of times from Satan and his ministers. And there's times where I make mistakes. And you wonder if it's all about worshiping a man other than Jesus Christ and his word's not the final authority, you'll never get people to get along. It takes the Holy Spirit and a perfect foundation to unite us and bring us together. Right? And you see this in 1 Corinthians, how Paul's going after him. We're supposed to be of the same mind and the same ju judgment. And you know where men start veering from this book? You know why, I mean? That's what I meant, why? What causes them to? The flesh. Not the heart. I'm pointing at the heart. But the flesh. Well, Paul says, Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 
I've seen great men of God, they start let, letting sins of the flesh come in, and then they start perverting this book to justify their sin, and it appeals to people. And people say, I'm going to follow that man. Instead of following this. The world. The world's way, you start, I've seen brethren start loving things of this world more than they love God's word. What do they do? They start perverting this, justifying their love of the world. Some get talked out of their faith, that shield of faith, by Satan and his enemies. Mm -hmm. Because what does Satan do? He says, Yea, hath God said. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. You can be the final authority. That's why man down here is not the final authority God is through his perfect written word. Galatians 3.28 says that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Remember what he said there? Now this I say to every one of you, saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. It's like saying, I'm in Paul, I'm in Apollos, I'm in Cephas, and some are saying I'm in Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Turn to John 12. John 12, 36. Why do people... Uh, I think this is what... Why do men get puffed up? Why do people have a hard time following this? And they fall into the trap of following a man instead. There's a good one right here in the book of John what Jesus had to put up with in his earthly ministry when he was preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel. Not the gospel we have today, but he was preaching a gospel. He was preaching truth. This is God manifest in the flesh. God the Father manifest in the flesh. When Jesus spoke, it was God the Father speaking. And they still had a problem. What was the problem? John 12, 36. While ye have light, believe in, that, in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the sayings of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah saith again, And he blindeth, he hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Why do we read that much? Because I want to get the context. He's trying to preach truth, and they're not taking it. However, let's keep reading. There's a group that did, but there's something very important about what's going on. Verse 41. These things saith Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Remember one of the requirements for salvation today is with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Confessing is part of salvation. Now there was confessing in the, king, uh, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, if I can get it out. And there's, there's prayer and confessing in the gospel that's for today. Okay? But the Pharisees did not confess him. Why wouldn't they confess him? Lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You can fall into the trap when Paul's up there talking about, I'm of Paul and I'm of Paul, so I'm, I got, I'm, I'm trying to please Paul, because I want Paul's praise. I'm trying to please Apollos, because I want Apollos' praise. I'm trying to please Cephas, because I want Cephas's praise. I'm trying to please Philip Newton, because I want Philip Newton's praise. I'm trying to please Peter Ruckman, because I want Peter Ruckman's praise. I'm trying to please Brian Denlinger, because I want Brian Denlinger's praise. I'm trying to please uh, David Daniels, Sam Gibb, because I want their praise. Whoever you watch, it always seems to happen like that. You can see it mainly in the Babel building system. I remember when I was a false convert in the Babel building system, it was always about trying to get the attention of the men up front. Whoever's standing behind the pulpit, whoever seems like they're, they're, they're preaching or they're teaching or uh, leading the, um, the worship team and stuff, the men that are, that are up in front, they're like, ooh, ah, I want their praise. I want them to notice me. No? Uh, no. 
We're supposed to want, well, first of all, God notices us, but we should want God's praise. Well done, thou good and faithful one. Brother says Christ, me telling you well done, brother, it can exhort you a little bit down here, but I ain't going to be the one standing, I'm not going to be up there at the judgment seat of Christ, it'll be me and the Lord, but when you walk up there, I'm not going to be up there patting you on the back along with Jesus Christ saying, well done. No, it's just going to be you and Jesus Christ. And my saying, well done, doesn't mean much compared to when Jesus says, well done. When you look at the scriptures, by the Holy Spirit, God shows you, okay, I am doing what's right. Praise the Lord for giving me the strength to do what's right. Thank you, Lord, for getting this out of my life. Thank you. Still give him all the glory. But you have that feeling that he's saying, well done. You did good. Well done. You want the praise of God over the praise of men. What happens with the praise of men? It gets you to do things. It can dist distract you from this, what truth is. It can distract you from doing things God's way. Because when they steer to the right, or they steer to the left, like Moses did, striking the rock twice. Aaron should have stood, if Aaron would have stood up to Moses and, t and corrected him in front of the people and said, what you did was wrong, I don't believe Aaron would have gotten in trouble. But what did Aaron do? I love him. I have to go along with it. This is the way to do it. Even though he knew God said otherwise. And you see a lot of people doing that today. All right. What is with man here is what is with mankind always wanting a man to praise? To worship and follow over the Lord. Why is it people in the history of the Bible, you find people, they always have to God talks about having a shepherd. You need a shepherd for the sheep. Absolutely. We're going to get into this. There's a difference between following somebody and I'm in him. Remember, we're supposed to be in Christ. We're not supposed to be in him. I'm of Christ. You know, I'm with Christ. He's in me, and I'm in him, you know. And uh, Paul says, well, no, you're of this, or you're of that. That's not how we're supposed to be. You can follow a man in ministry, but you're not supposed to be of him. We're not in him. Okay? But you look in the Bible, there's people that always seem to surround themselves by a man. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 9. How many remember 1 Samuel? The whole big thing we talked about, the king. Who was the first king of Israel? Do you guys remember that question? Who was the first king of Israel? If you said God, you'd be correct. If you said Saul, you'd be incorrect. You'd be wrong. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 9. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 9. Once again, we're going to keep this short. Pause the video and you can read 1 through 9. But this is when the people come to Samuel and say, Make him a king like all the people around us. Make us a king. We want a king and be just like everyone around us. Brothers says Christ, you know who does a lot of the respect of persons? False religions. Heathens. Paganism. World. The world does. Why are we falling in the trap of acting like everybody around us? We're supposed to be set apart. We're not supposed to be respect of persons. But you read that, they come to Samuel and say, make us a king. How did God respond? In 1 Samuel 8, 7... He says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee. Because remember, Samuel is the shepherd that God is, the man of God that God is working through to judge the people. He says, the, the, For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. God was their king. And they rejected God as their king. So it's no, therefore, no shock. So God comes down and... Okay, uh, so it's no shock because we're going to get ahead. I'm getting ahead of myself again. They rejected their king in the Old Testament. They wanted a man down here to worship. They tried to act like it wasn't to worship. Just to rule it. No, to worship. To be their leader. To be the boss. Someone that they could praise and try to get them to praise them. Back and forth, you know. So what does God do? He comes down in the likeness of sinful flesh, a man. And they still reject him. Romans 8.3 says, For what the law could not do, and that was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. God the Father gave up his incorruptible body in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, and angel of the Lord, that man, captain of the host of heaven. Okay? And he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
That likeness of sinful flesh was created, and some people get stuck on that and think that Jesus was just a created being. No, the likeness of sinful flesh, that was created. He was born of a virgin, Mary. Okay? He came as man, as one of us. That's what the people wanted. We want a man down here to rule over us like all the nations. So what does God do? He sends his son, his own flesh, his own body, and the likeness of sinful flesh to be their king. Christ, the king of the Jews. Thou art, remember Paul, uh, Peter, he asked them, what, who do the, who's the world say that I am? And they asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ. In other words, the king of the Jews. The son of the living God. You're not just king of the Jews. You're God manifest in the flesh. To be our king. And came down here to be our king. God make a sacrifice. He sacrificed his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. Then he ends up sacrificing his life for the world. So that you and I can, got, could get saved, brother says Christ. Matthew 16, 16 says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's in Matthew 16, 16. Okay? But John 19, 15, turn to John 19, 15. How do the people react in the end? Remember, you had to believe that he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. You had to confess it and hold true to it until he started reigning. And you had to be water baptized, and you had to get your life cleaned up, preparing for him to rule and reign. Okay. The, Jew, uh, the, the apostles all fled. And you had Peter who denied him three times. The first, the people, uh, you had the, I'm sorry, the apostles deserted him. Then you had the people desert him, because one week they're saying, Hosanna in the highest, and the next week they're saying, crucify him. So the people deserted him, uh, the two deserted him, and the third one was the, the religious crowd. Okay. John 19, 15, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. What is it with, this is hard for people to, to rally behind and stand behind today, especially in these last days, but stand behind. Why is this so hard? Because it's easier for, it's so fleshly and easier to, to, to rally behind a man than it is the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect written word. Even when he was here in the flesh, they couldn't seem to do it. Okay. So he came in a man for them, and he's a man that they were supposed to be, not respect, necessarily respect the persons, but he's God. They were supposed to, you know, praise him, and, and they were supposed to seek his praise, because he's God Almighty. And they still couldn't do it. Right? And I got to thinking, it's like, so what is this? What is keeping men, why is men so, how do you say, like, gravitated, they just tend to go towards respect of persons versus thus saith the Lord. And I can follow someone and say, yeah, he's great, but when he doesn't line up with this, I'm sticking with this, and I'm sorry you're wrong, this is right. Remember my two rules in this ministry. One of my two biggest rules is this. This is the King James Bible. I've done the, the Bible version issue study. This is God's perfect written word in English. I believe it. Okay. It effectually worketh also in you that believe, the Bible says. But once again, you have to believe in the Holy Scriptures for you to believe that quote. Okay. But rule number one, this is always right. Rule number two, if this is wrong, refer to rule number one. The Bible is always right. But people will start gravitating towards this. Yeah, he might be wrong, but i got to make an excuse for him because I'm of him. Oh, he, I don't think he's wrong. He's got to be right because I'm of him. Well, what about the Bible? Oh, that, that, it's not, that's not a big deal. Just, just trust him. We're following him because we're of him. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. You know why people love respect of persons over absolute truth? Now we're going to go a little bit into false religions, uh, false converts, and even brethren, we're going to put it all together. You know why? 2 Timothy 4, 4, 1. 
I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, at his appearing, the judgment seat of Christ. Brothers of Christ, that's why I keep pushing you. Keep your eyes on that blessed hope, looking for Jesus Christ to call us home, looking for the judgment seat of Christ, making sure you're, you're living a life of Christ and you're working towards that judgment seat of Christ, where we all have to stand before Jesus Christ. The, the praise that matters. And he's going to either tell us, well done, thou good and faithful one, or you get in by the skin of your teeth and he just shakes your head at you and just so disappointed in you. Move on, next. Or at his kingdom. Okay. The great white throne judgment. Verse 2. We call it the great white throne. It's called, it's called the right, great white throne where there's a judgment. And we just put it together and say great throne. I've been correct before. The great white throne judgment is what we call it. But all three words are there in the same verse. It just doesn't call that, it just says the great white throne, and there's a judgment there. That's what I believe this is talking about. Verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And some brethren today, in these last days, are getting distracted by the world, and their world, and they're not preaching the word, they're preaching the world. They become a talk show. They're preaching this. Me, myself, and I. What I think, what I feel... You know, how I would do something. And they've forgotten that this is supposed to be what we're preaching. If you're a man that claims to be in ministry, this is what we're supposed to be preaching. Long-suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. See these channels on YouTube, and these uh, some of them are hirelings, some of them are brothers that have lost their way, but people in these battle buildings behind the pulpit, they start putting on a good show, and they start talking about worldly stuff, and that's popular today. Especially among false converts. They don't want this. They want the world. So what do they do? But after their own lush, they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll find someone that tells them what they want to hear so they can worship that man. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables because that's what they want to believe. They don't want to believe the truth. They want to believe fables. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 verse 13. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first and my temptation which was in my flesh he despised not nor rejected but received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul saying the first time I came to you I gave you truth. You wanted the truth. You had love of the truth. I gave you the truth. You accepted it. Where is then this blessedness you speak of? For I bear record that it had been possible, you would, if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them unto me. Someone pointed that out. Just a side note, little rabbit trail. Someone pointed this out to me and asked, he said, was the reason that a lot of people wrote letters for Paul, like Paul would speak and they would dictate it, was because Paul had a problem with his eyesight? Could that have been the thorn in the flesh? Having problems seeing. You might be able to see a little bit, but you know when it comes to like really close or really far seeing or something like that. But there was a time they were like, we would do anything for you, Paul. Not because they're worshiping him, because he's got the truth. Because Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's got the truth. We want the truth. But what happens? Paul comes back a second time and finds them messed up. So he tries to get them back to the truth. And how do they respond? Remember Galatians? They're getting over to a false gospel. Verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Yeah. Do you guys remember the story of Paul and Barnabas when they went into that town to preach the truth to them? He, they healed somebody and they, they started treating them like gods and Paul became Jupiter and Barnabas I think was Mercury or Mercurius. And they loved them as long as they could worship them. But when Paul and Barnabas... Uh, they tore, they tore, the, they rent their clothes and went to him and said, "We're just like men of you. No, don't do this. It's not right." They went from loving them to throwing them out, kind of like Jesus Christ, crucify him. One minute, Hosanna in the highest. The next minute, crucified him. And he was God manifest. Is was and is and is to come. He's God Almighty manifest in the flesh. Paul and Barnabas aren't. There's something about people that they want to worship a man other than Jesus Christ, other than God Almighty. Right. 
2 Peter 2.2 2 says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by the reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What I'm realizing, brothers and Christ, please, this is an ex exhortation. Get back in the Word of God and get back to finding your love for the Word of God. A lot of ministries out there are floating away. They're, they're floating away from this. And they're getting into worldliness. Right. But the number one ministries that are normally hated, used to be hated. I know some ministries that used to be hated because they stuck with this. Now they're loved by, the, by you know, um, easy believism. When they te when I know Brother Christ, easy believism, when he believes the true plan of salvation, but he's got easy believism in his comment section, patting him on the back. He's got post-trib, when he doesn't believe in post-trib, and mid-tribbers patting him on the back, and because he's become a talk show, a worldly talk show. He's not sticking with this. If he sticks with this, Brother Christ, this ministry, this ministry here, I, I believe one of the reasons is I've made some mistakes in my past, and sometimes you have to live with the scars of your, of your sins and the mistakes that you made, the scars. I've repented, I've gotten my heart right with the Lord, and I know God has forgiven me. But some people, especially the enemy, but even some brethren start acting like enemy and try to hold my past mistakes against me. I've had some people do the enemy and some brethren that are acting like enemies, doing a, doing a smear campaign against me. But I, I like to believe, and I, I do believe this, that one of the reasons why I'm not that big is because I'm preaching truth. And truth today is just not popular. People don't have time to sit down for a two-hour uh, Bible study. They can sit there and watch people gossip back and forth for four hours, doing a live chat, just gossiping and, and shooting the breeze and telling your feelings and opinions and gossiping and backbiting and whispering for four hours. But they can't handle an hour to, to two hours worth of Bible studies? Comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture? We're told this in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Now, I believe he's talking about when you actually get into the time of Jacob's trouble. But remember, we're, there's things there's, we can see signs leading up to the time of Jacob's trouble, but we're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. This is going to be a strong warning. It's probably going to upset some brethren. But I'm telling you this right now, if you're following a ministry, whether it's on YouTube or a battle building, and the person preaching can't seem, keeps, seems like he's always looking for the time of Jacob's trouble, you need to take a break from that person. Withdraw yourself from that person for a while. So you can get your heart right with the Lord and get back to looking for that blessed hope. We're not to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Now we can see signs again of things leading up to it, but when we see those signs, there's supposed to be motivation that we better hurry up. That means we could get called home any day now. We need to get back to making sure our heart's right with the Lord and that we're living for Him. But Amos 8, 11 says, Behold, the day come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of God. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now some people say, well, it's because this isn't here. No, I don't believe it's because this isn't here. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. This will still be here in the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe what this is talking about is, they're going to say, I want the truth, and some guy comes along, you know, teachers, having teachers having itching ears, tells them what they want to hear, and they get hook, line, and sinker. That person's gone. He was trying to find the truth, but didn't find it. This person goes over here, you know what I'm saying? They keep falling for these false truths, fables, respect of persons, false gospels, false religions. And the main false religion they're going to be falling for in the time of Jacob's trouble is taking the mark and worshiping the beast, Mystery Babylon. But brothers, this Christ, I've also hit brethren, I've had people, how do I say, I hope they're brethren, I've had people come on and try to butter me up, and I keep telling them, stop worshiping me, stop glorifying me, give God the glory. If God gives me a good Bible study, praise God, give God the glory. Give God the glory. Okay? And they start out trying to, trying to like, be respecter of persons, and they try to lift me up. I put a stop to it ASAP, and the next thing you know, I don't really hear from them anymore. Why? Because they're looking for someone to worship. Someone to prop up a respecter of persons. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong, there's probably a lot of men out there that are better men to be propped up, but we're not supposed to prop up anybody but Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Now, examples of respecter of persons in the Bible, Paul and Barnabas. If you want to turn to Acts 36. I think I put it in wrong, but Acts 36. I hope I have the right one. I always point this out because people will say, Paul and Barnabas. We already did a huge study on this. Bar Paul and Barnabas. Well, it was just, you know... They just went their separate ways. They just had a, a, something you can agree to disagree on, and they just went their separate ways. That's a lie. That's a false teaching. Acts 36. Let's see if I got the right... Yes, I do have it wrong, because there is no Acts 36. Somehow I put the wrong numbers in here. I think I put the verses in there, 36, 41, but I, didn't put, I, I missed the uh, chapter. But there's a chapter in here <laughs> where the verses are 36 and 41. We'll just talk about it, but um, you can always pause the video and look it up. But there's a time where Paul and Barnabas disagree about something, and they go their separate ways. And it's all based off respect of persons. Okay? Barnabas and Paul, they're talking about going and checking with the rest of the church... Confirming the churches. I still wish I could find it. <laughs> but I wrote it in wrong. And it's my fault for writing it in wrong. But but here's the story. Paul and Barnabas. Okay, they've gone all over the place preaching the gospel, putting their lives on the line, and Paul talks about this through the Bible, that those who sow the seed are, are, must first be partakers of the fruit. Okay, you get to be partakers of the fruit. So they went around sowing seeds, preaching the gospel, leading people to Christ, and they were putting their lives on the line to do it. They were thrown in prison, they were beaten, Paul was stoned to death once, I don't know if he was actually stoned to death. We think he was, but the Bible says they thought he was dead, but Paul got back up. Okay. The point is, is they did all the hard work and, and they, they sowed the seed. You have a man there who's Mark, whose surname is John, who when it came time to preach the gospel, to not be ashamed of the gospel, to put his life on the line, he got fearful and he, he, almost like saying he chickened out. He chickened out, and he didn't go. He wouldn't go to the actual work that matters when it comes to being an evangelist. Now, part of an evangelist is preaching the gospel, going out and preaching the gospel to everyone you see, to a point, yes. But what gets left out is part of being an evangelist, that's the first part, sowing the seed. The other part of the evangelist is being, for, being partakers of the fruit. An evangelist sets up churches... Ordained elders, bishops, deacons. An evangelist goes around to those churches and checks with them every so often to see if they're staying on the right path and they haven't lost their way. Okay, we see that in Galatians. We see that in First and Second Corinthians where they start to lose their way. Okay, so Paul says, okay, we're going to go around and we're going to confirm these churches. We, we sowed the seed and now it's time to reap the fruit. The fellowship, to go see how they're doing and everything and making sure that the, the church is running properly. And Mark wants all of a sudden now, Mark, who's surnamed John, I hope I got the name right, he wants to go. And Paul says, no, you didn't go to the work. It's not good because you didn't go to the work with us. You didn't plant, you didn't sow, you didn't plow. You can't reap. You don't get to get the fruit. And Barnabas is like, and Barnabas should know known better, okay, but Barnabas, for some reason, this Mark, whose surname was John, had such a high standing in Barnabas' eyes that, well, this guy is the exception. This guy, we can make an exception for him. We can look the other way for him. And Paul really got into Barnabas saying, hey. And this isn't the only time Barnabas has stumbled and fallen. Remember when Paul, if you remember the story of Paul, where He's when the Jews come, he hangs out with the Jews and acts like he doesn't know the saved Gentiles, his brothers and sisters in Christ that are Gentiles. And when the Jews leave, then, oh, now I can be your friend and everything. And he was playing both sides. And Paul had to withstand him to his face. Guess who also got caught away with that dissimulation? Barnabas did. Oh, this is Peter. 
Well, if he's doing it, I'm of him. I guess I've got to do it too. He already had that problem. But once again, they'll try to tell you they just agree to disagree. No, Barnabas was a respecter of persons. Paul was holding everybody accountable. I understand the letters were being written, but the spoken word, he was holding everybody accountable to God's way. And God says you must first be a sower in order to reap the fruit, to be a partaker in the fruit. That man wouldn't sow. Barnabas was 100% wrong. And they, they clashed so much, they went their separate ways. Remember, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas. What causes the most division and actual... Because I believe Barnabas is saved. I believe Peter, uh, Paul was saved. And I believe even Mark, whose surname is John, I believe he probably was saved too. He just lacked the courage to put his life on the line for the gospel. But what causes so much division in the body of Christ today? And you start following something like this. You follow some man out there that you're following and you put this to side. Anytime he doesn't line up with this book, this book gets put to the side. I love him. I'm going to follow him. What keeps you from trusting the Lord and acknowledging him in all thy ways? Respecter of persons. Here's another example. Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Galatians chapter 1. We were just talking about this. Galatians chapter 1. How people come in, they're going to confirm the churches, and people are coming in and messing them up. Okay? They come in. The Bible talks about with good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple. You have these men coming in looking like there's something. People in the Bible buildings with their nice suit and tie. I remember what someone once said that the people who wear nice suits and ties are lawyers and car salesmen. Uh, government. People who are there to lie to you and deceive you. They're there to push an agenda that they want, a narrative that they want. They're, they're running a business. Most of these Babel buildings, I call them Babel buildings, some, the world calls them church buildings. Babel buildings, they're a business. They're running a business. Now there's some men I've known that stand behind the pulpit with nice suit and ties that have preached truth. But they always eventually get tainted by the Babel building system and start straying from this hardcore and they're part of a philosophy, remember, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. Those three things. They get so messed up because they stop following this. Okay. But there's something about these men that come into Galatia and start getting them to turn on the gospel that Paul preached to them. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And someone comes along and says, no, 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 that's not it. Galatians chapter 1. Okay. Same thing here. I'm glad I, I remember it's chapter 1. For some reason, the chapters are not in my notes. I tried to type them in. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. You know how many times Paul kept saying, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle. That's why you're supposed to be followers of me as I am of Christ. I'm an apostle. Okay. We are supposed to follow Paul. All ministries are supposed to line up with Paul's ministry. And if they don't line up with Paul's ministry, have nothing to do with them. Okay. By man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the church of Galatia, grace, peace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world, world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Someone came in with pearly whites, Probably a nice suit and tie. Good words and fair speeches. Someone that put themselves up here to get people to look up at him and go, Ooh, ah, he's important. He's someone I can follow. He's someone I can praise and see if I can get him to praise me. Verse 7, Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Stop worshiping the man. He's to be accursed. People come in, teach, uh, you have to merit salvation. You have to, you know, be worthy of salvation. You have to earn salvation. They're accursed. Someone comes in and turns faith into works by saying faith alone, making it of themselves. The easy believism, the repentantless gospel. They're preaching a false gospel. Let them be accursed. Once again, if you disagree with me, show me chapter and verse where it says faith alone. Easy believism. Where it says free grace. God's grace, to have God's grace, the Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. God's grace came at a cost. We just didn't have to pay it. The cost of His Son on the cross. Now that gift of saving us, what's that gift? Everlasting life. And that gift is free. It is. And I can, you can use Scripture to back up everything I'm saying. But my whole point is, is you got people coming in with these false gospels. If they could only say it the way the Bible says it, their false gospel would evaporate in the air. It holds in the water. It's like a bucket with a lot of holes. It holds in the water. What do they do? They've got to turn on this and get people to worship the man. I love him, and if he says this is the gospel, eh, I love him. I guess I'll follow him. What happened to being a Berean? As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do now I for do now I say, for do I now persuade men or God? The good words and fair speeches, having teachers having itching ears. This man tells me what I want to hear, I'll worship him. You know the number one gospel, false gospel in this world today? Easy believism. Faith alone. They take repentance out. They even take prayer out. Just head knowledge. You have the knowledge. And the latter end is worse than the beginning. It would have been better if they had not known the way of righteousness. Okay? Just the knowledge. Their heart doesn't belong to God. It's still their own. And sometimes they give their hearts to men down here and start worshiping men down here. Respect their persons. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Men pleasers. So they can get them to worship him. You can see that in these battle buildings. You can start to see this online with a lot of these false people. They're men pleasers. Right? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul wasn't a man pleaser. Here's the truth. Take it or leave it. Oh, we'll take it. Okay, good. Then he goes out and continues his uh, ministry evangelizing, and he comes back to check on the churches to see how they're doing, being a partaker of the fruit. And he finds out some guy comes in and talks them out of it, tells them what they want to hear. See, people always seem to feel better if they can earn it. And don't get me wrong, down here the Bible says, if a man doesn't eat, or if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. There is a good feeling about uh, taking joy uh, in Ecclesiastes, that a man take joy in, his, in the labor of his hands. The fruit of his labor. There is some joy in that, and that, that you've worked hard, and that you've earned something. The hard part is saying, I can't earn heaven. I can't earn that gift that God has. Everlasting life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. And that goes into these things that are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. But it's that whole thing about, I can't earn it. And that's hard for some people. I've always got to earn it, because you have good worth ethics. ethics. I understand that, brothers of Christ. But we came to the cross saying, uh, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I think it was an old song, an old hymn. All right. We can't earn salvation. You can't. Someone comes into Galatia and tells them you have to earn it. And that appeals to them. I can earn it? You mean I, I can really earn it? That way it's mine and it can be how, whatever I want? I'm the authority? I'm, you know, now the gospel now becomes mine and I can make it whatever I want it to be because I earned it? Verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which we preach of, which was preached of me, 
is not after man. Like I said, all these false gospels, you won't find them in the Bible. A lot of times they like to cherry pick. I'm going to grab this verse, I'm going to grab that verse, I'm going to grab this. What happened to 2 Timothy 2.15? Studying to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, we don't have to study. I'm just going to find a verse in here that tells me what I want to hear. And you can. If you're not dispensational, you can go to the Old Testament and grab verses that say you have to earn salvation in the Gospels. Uh, you can go to the time of Jacob's trouble and books that are on the time of Jacob's trouble and the Jews going through the time of Jacob's trouble that talk about having to earn it. It's about works. And you can have that. If you want it to be the, the, the false gospel of faith alone, then you just grab the verses that say believe. Ignore the verses that say you have to repent. Ignore the verses that say you have to confess, both in prayer, your repentance and your belief in prayer. Ignore the verses where it says you have to ask God to save you, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just ignore all that and just cherry pick and grab only the ones that say believe, 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 only believe, only believe. You can make this book say whatever you want when you cherry pick. He says, this preached to me is not after man. Stop doing things man's way and start doing things God's way. Verse 12, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The, the gospel that we follow today is the gospel that's revealed to Paul. Okay. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Jump over to verse 3, 1. You say, well, what does this have to do with this? Men came in... And for some reason, there was something about them that the people started elevating them above the Word of God that Paul preached. And Paul just said, it's not of man, it's of God. I am the apostle to the Gentiles, appointed by Jesus Christ. Okay? What happened? Verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. There were some people there that actually saw the crucifixion of Christ, but was still deceived by these men coming in and started elevating these men in respect to their persons above the Word of God, above their own eyes. Good words and fair speeches. This only what I've learned of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And he starts going back and having to re-preach the gospel to him. Okay. All over again. But you see there, someone comes in, respect her, and they put on this good show and getting people to be respect her persons, to elevate them above the Word of God. Do you see that happening today? I do. I see that even among brethren, where they start getting that cult of personality, the worship of that man. And it starts going to their head. And what Paul says is, think not, you should not think highly, more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And if you think you know something, you, uh, you know nothing as you ought to know. When someone starts to become a know-it-all, I'm the final authority. You have to come to me and only me for the truth. They know nothing as they ought to know. They need to be humbled. What about Simon the sorcerer? Acts 8. Turn to Acts 8. Here's another example of a respecter of persons that come in and bewitches people. Now we just read about someone coming in to Galatia, to the church of Galatia, brothers of Christ that are saved, but then they get turned to a false gospel. I believe some of them I probably weren't saved that they were so easily swayed, but can a brother in Christ get messed up when it comes to the gospel? We did a study on this. Bottom line, bottom line, what does the Bible say? Whether you believe they, they're saved and they've really lost their way, or you believe that they're lost, what does the Bible say? Let them be accursed. Period. If anybody, whether you believe they're saved or long, starts preaching a false gospel, whether they're saved or lost, if they're starting to preach a false gospel, you're to have nothing to do with them. But here's a man that, when it came to the Jews... Let's read this. Simon the Sorcerer, Acts 8, 9. That one had the chapter. Acts 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, given out that himself was some great one. He got the people to worship him. Respect to persons. 
to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. You have a lot of fakes and frauds out there today that they act like they're men of God, but they're not. Why? All you have to do is use this to see right through them. And you know why people can't see through them? They're not using this. They don't know the Word of God like they should know the Word of God, and they're not using it. Not most of these so-called great men of God in the world today, they're supposed to be great Christian men of God, they don't even use God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. They use Bible perversions, and they just read a couple scriptures, and then they go off and, and they put on a show to please the crowd. And boy, are they pleased. The great power of God. And to him they had a regard, to him they they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery, good words and fair speeches, having teachers having itching ears. He told them what their flesh wanted to hear. Not what their soul needed to hear, but what their flesh wanted to hear. Remember Paul, uh, Paul says, I tell you the truth. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? What I tell you is not of man, it's of God. Paul was telling them what they needed, what the soul needed to hear. Someone like this guy tells the people, the flesh of the people, what it wants to hear. Bewitch them with sorcery. Mm -hmm. There you see Simon the sorcerer. They start, what happens? Paul comes in and preaches the truth, and there's some of them that's like, their, their soul's like, I want the truth. And Paul, uh, I don't know if it's Paul, let me, let me look at it again. This might have been Peter. But let's keep going. But when they believed, Philip preaches. Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, in the name of the Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. It's water baptism, then he was still, Philip was still preaching the kingdom of heaven. Remember, Acts is a transition book. I think he's preaching the kingdom of heaven, which is also called the kingdom of God. But the point is, is he started preaching the truth, and the soul's like, I want the truth. I want the truth. And they're being freed from that respecter of persons. When you get saved, brother says Christ, you're supposed to be freed from that respecter of persons. The Holy Spirit comes in and He guides you into all truth. And today we have the whole Word of God in one volume called the Bible. Bible just means uh, library of books. Multiple books in one book, if you want to say it that way. Right? The Holy Scriptures can be found in the King James Bible for English-speaking people today. Right? You have the Holy Spirit you got free from being like the world and acting like the world and talking like the world. And the world loves to be respecter of persons. They love to worship people down here. That's not supposed to be us. Um, a, a real world example. I hate to... Uh, Sam Gipp, he does some good work. I have some of his books on the Bible version issue. But the problem I have with that man is sometimes he'll grab this book and that man is very spoiled by philosophy. And he tries to teach things in a philosophical way, and sometimes he makes a huge mess of the Bible. And I'm going to use him as a bad, good, bad example. Okay, He's a brother in Christ. I've learned from him. Okay, I owe God first, and I owe him second when it comes to what I've learned from him in the, uh, when it comes to the Bible version issue. And how the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. But remember, this is the final authority, not Sam Gibbs. Just because he's done so much for me, I don't want to put him up on a pedestal in a sense that he's above this. Now, Sam Gibb put out a study once, and that study, I guess, you know, sometimes we get excited. I've done it. I've had to take down a couple videos because I got excited, and I thought I was on to something new, and I go to preach it, and someone points out a lot of errors. It had a lot of holes, and I had to take it down because, oh, Lord, I don't know what I was thinking. I was wrong. I just thought I was onto something and really was like, I want to share something new with the breath. I was wrong. What did Sam Gibb do? Well, Sam Gibb came out because he was trying to push how important um, Emmanuel is, the, the, the title and the name for Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. That he came out with a teaching saying that Joseph was in sin, was an error, which is sin. He was an error, is in sin for naming the child Jesus, and so was Mary. And we're all like, wait, wait, wait. He started out kind of good, and then we're all like, wait a second. There's two verses that will debunk that whole teaching like that. And those two verses where Joseph was commanded to name the child Jesus, 
And Mary was commanded by God through an angel, the angel of the Lord for Joseph in his dream. It was Jesus in a dream. Uh, and then through another angel, I was getting mixed up, Michael or Gabriel, uh, to Mary. She actually stood there and told her, but they were both commanded to name the child Jesus. Not Emmanuel, Jesus. And he purposely, because pur the man ain't an idiot, he purposely left out those two verses. Like I said, you can sometimes, I'm, I'll take it back. I apologize. Maybe it was an accident because Brothers Christ, sometimes when we get to te get to studying, we can start getting there and like we're looking for a specific thing and we want the Bible to say specific things. Brothers Christ, there's times I've done studies and had to throw it out because I wanted the Bible to say something because I thought it was onto something and I wanted the Bible to say this and no matter how much I tried, there was just too many holes in the bucket. It couldn't hold the water. And I had to throw the study out. Sometimes I still learn something new, which is great. You can always learn something new. But the point of the, what I, the study I was doing, I was like, I couldn't do it. Maybe he got so narrow-minded that, uh, not narrow-minded, but, you know, uh, narrow vision, that he wanted to say what he wanted to say, so he put together a study that told him what he wanted to hear. But the point is, he's clearly, obviously, 100% wrong, according to the Scriptures. He was saying that they should have named the child Emmanuel and they were wrong for not naming the child Emmanuel, for naming the child Jesus. And a lot of us who love Sam Gip, we've learned from Sam Gip, we're not enemies, we're brethren. Other men in ministry, we say, Sam Gip, uh, here's the two verses you, purp you either purposely left out or you overlooked. Here's the two verses that clearly debunk what you just said, what you're trying to teach. Now, you can do a teaching on Emmanuel and how important it is, how it's God with us. Jesus is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. He, remember, we just talked about it. He sent his own son. You want a man down here to be king? I'm, I'm going I'm to come down here. God the Father is going to come down here in the flesh, and I'm going to be your king. So he sent his son, the son of God, the son of man, the son of, of David, to be their king. Okay? There's nothing wrong with doing an amazing study on Emmanuel. But he said that they were in sin, they were in error, they were wrong, okay, for, for calling the child Jesus. No, they were doing what they were commanded by God to do. Brothers of Christ, here's where the respect of persons come in. You had people that would, were vehemently defending the man. Either they're ignorant of this, or you're dealing with, like, I believe the, the Babel buildings are full of a lot of lost people. I really do. Because this is not their final authority. Could you imagine what happened? I've come across people that they vehemently defend respecter of persons. Their main, that their following can be 100% wrong, so easy to prove wrong. And they just, they, they fight to them to the death. Could you imagine how much good they can do for our Lord and Savior if they actually fight for this to the death? They would give their lives to Jesus Christ. I mean, not, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about, it, as a saved sinner, would be willing to give my life for Jesus Christ, fight for him to the death, standing for this book. But a lot of brethren these days spend a lot of time fighting for men down here because they worship the men down here when they're obviously wrong. Sam Gipp was 100% wrong. Now, I don't know if he ever did owe up to it. He kind of, they tried they tried to judge. Well, what he really meant way back. I don't I don't I don't care about what he meant because in the sense that I'm talking about his error. There's times I've done teachings where I've made a mistake in an error, and the brother's like, I know what you meant, but a brother comes to me and corrects me, which is a good thing because I want to line up with the book. And if I slip up and say something wrong according to this book, whether I'm misquoting verse, or I said something wrong, like. Um, I said, for the longest time, I kept saying John was exiled to the island of Patmos. But the Bible doesn't say that. No, it just says John was in the island of Patmos. And one of the key words there is was. <laughs> was in the island of Patmos. He's not there anymore when he's writing the letter, the opening to the letter. He's not in the island of Patmos anymore. But it never says that. I, said, I get corrected. I'm like, Lord, I want to line up with this book. And the man, Sam Gipp, was so puffed up with pride... That at the time, I don't know if he has now, but at the time, he wouldn't repent. He wouldn't say, hey, you know what? You're right. I, I kind of overdid it. 
I was trying to express the importance of Emmanuel and, and everything, God with us, and that Jesus is God, but, but I kind of, I failed in that area by t making uh, Joseph and Mary out to be rebelling against God and, raw, and erring towards God. Okay. But you had men that would vehemently defend them. What is that? They've fallen prey to the, to the respecter of persons. They've elevated the man Sam Gibbs so high that he's above this. And when he and this don't agree, guess who they follow? Sam Gibbs. Some, some actually came to me, praise God, came to me and said, you know what? You're right. He was wrong in what he said. He, probably, he shouldn't have said that. I still love him for his, his stance for the King James Bible, and I've learned a lot from him, and that's what I say. I learned a lot from him. But in that area, what he did, he was 100% wrong. You're right. Or, and I'm like, I'm not right. The, the book's right. The book's right. I'm just standing by the book. Okay. Those are men who love Sam Gibb and respect him, but they're not respecter of persons. The one that didn't care about this book were vehemently defending the man and at the point of attacking me. What did Paul say? Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Okay. Uh, Peter Ruckman, I'll use him. These are men I believe are saved. They love the Lord. Okay, they're doing work for the Lord. But there are people that start elevating him, these men, on a different level than this. And when they don't agree, which one are you supposed to follow? You're supposed to follow this. Now, Peter Ruckman, I'll just do a short one, okay? So he does a teaching. He says, if it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. It was a good teaching. It was a good teaching. It would have been better if he'd have used more scripture instead of worldly uh, stories and, and put on a show with the chalk talk. It would have been better if he could back it more with this. But if it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. And there's times in his life and the videos that I've watched him that he'll sit there and he'll draw angels. This is just one situation, but there's a lot of times where he'll do something and say it's not the right way, and then he has some kind of excuse why he does it anyway. What happened if it's wrong? Quit it. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. And the most easiest one I can do that's right in your face, Brother Jesus Christ, is drawing angels with wings. He admits that angels in the Bible don't have wings. It is wrong to believe angels have wings. But he draws them with wings. And when you correct the man, and I went to correct him on it, you know, he's, he's dead. He's with our Lord and Savior. He's, he's in heaven right now. Okay? Passed away a few years back. I'm not, probably longer than that. It's been a while. It's been a while. Um, but when I go to say, okay, this man was wrong in, in this, and what he was doing, I had people attack me. That man's been dead uh, four or five years. And people today are still worshiping that man and elevating that man above this book. Once again, I learned a lot about the Bible from Peter Ruckman. I also learned a lot about the Bible, some things about the Bible version issue, how to stand for this book from Peter Ruckman. I owe the man, I owe God first, but I owe the man. I'm, I, I, I want to honor the man, and I am, because I'm holding him accountable to this book, like he always told everyone to do. You hold everyone accountable to this book. This is the foundation. But you still have people vehemently, vehemently defending the man because they worship him. Brothers of Christ, I don't think I'll ever get to that level. We're in the last days. I'm a small ministry, praise God. I'm grateful to be used. I had to learn, you know, sometimes God had to kick me to be content with what he has for me in ministry and everything. And you guys know my numbers on my, my views aren't huge. Okay, I'm content with what I have, but I don't want anybody ever worshiping me and holding me above this book. Another little rabbit trail, we might talk about this someday somewhere else, but I'm frustrated with the brethren, brethren in Christ because when you disagree with one another, you just kick each other to the curb like they're nothing. If you disagree with me on something, I've always had an open door. I, I, we connect on Skype, Messenger. I, I opened up a, 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 someone wanted to talk on Discord, so I opened up a channel on Discord. So I have Discord, uh, Facebook Messenger, um, Skype, and someone was talking about there was a, there's lots of video platforms to talk back and forth and everything. Um, 
there's some brethren that, you know, because I don't trust anyone, but I've given some brethren that I believe are saved, their brethren, my home phone number. Call me up. We'll sit there and talk and open the Bible if you disagree with me on something. True love for your brothers and sisters in Christ is when you see them going down the wrong way, the wrong path. True love forms to try to get them back on the right path. But today you've been taught, well, if I disagree with them, just kick them to the curb like they're nothing. Uh, no, we try to get them back on the right path. If Peter Ruckman was still alive today, I try to share some of the things I disagree with them on and try to get them back on the right path, just like I did Sam Gipp, just like I did David Daniels. Once again, another man who taught me things about the Bible, but more about the Bible version issue. Okay, and there were some things I disagreed with him. I went and talked to him about it to try to get him back on the right path. To get him back to standing for this book, because he started drifting away to, 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 to standing for uh, philosophy and traditions of men and rudiments of the world. He started straying from this book whole nother issue. We don't have to go into that issue, but the whole point is, is you had men vehemently defending him when he was 100% wrong. Okay. The Bible's right. When we're wrong, remember rule number one, the Bible's always right. This is the final authority. Okay. So you have people in the Bible that they start worshiping men and, and going down the wrong path. They stop trusting the Lord and his way and what he said and they start saying things the way man says it. Okay. And I, I got, I know I'm seeing, I'm, I'm back. I get frustrated by this because I love these men of God that I mentioned. I love my brothers and sisters Christ when I correct you. And I know that some of you love me when you're correcting me and I take the correction, okay? But I get so frustrated how easy it is, the, the division in the body of Christ today. It's like every man for himself. I had a brother in Christ, I know it's kind of going off a little bit, I had a brother in Christ talk to me and said he's scared to say anything these days. He's very scared in a conversation, whether it's online or in person, he's scared to say something because he's so scared of saying either he says something that's right that everyone disagrees with and he loses the fellowship, or he's scared that he might say something wrong and instead of a brother coming to him with love to correct him, they kick him to the curb like he's nothing. That's the world we live in today. Everyone's about respecter of persons. Everyone's about every man for himself. What was Aaron's, not demise, but what brought him down greatly? Respecter of persons. He couldn't go in to see the promised land because of respecter of persons. He didn't stand up to Moses and say, hey, God's right, you're wrong. Sometimes I fail to do that. I've been a coward before when it comes to correcting people. The number one person I was the number one coward in correcting was Brian Denlinger. It uh, used to be King James Video Ministries, now it's Born Again Barbarian. But there's areas that I believe that if I had corrected him when it was a small problem, before it got to a big problem, and I would have just stood for the Word of God, and I had done it with love and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, not being adversarial, I might have been able to help him, and him me. But what happens? We just keep our yap shut, and when it gets to a, being a big problem, we just kick them to the curb like they're nothing. I've been a coward before. Brothers this Christ, we need to actually go and talk to people and hold this as the final authority, and not be above correction. Not above correction. But there's people that would vehemently defend this. Brothers this Christ, if I'm wrong according to the Scriptures, and it's been proven with beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was wrong according to the Scriptures, don't be worshiping me. Do not be defending me to the death. Defend this to the death. With your whole heart. Real quick, there's a difference between I'm of so-and-so and following someone's ministry. Today it's Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles, which we talked about. You made that a point in all the, uh, the Pauline epistles that I'm an Apostle to the Gentiles, appointed by Jesus Christ. The difference between I'm of so-and-so and following someone's ministry. There's nothing wrong with following ministries. I follow. I used to follow a lot, but it's kind of shrunk down because brethren have gone their separate ways as far as away from this and to the world. Okay, to the point some of them they're to the point where they start preaching a false gospel, and it's like, wait a second. Sad. It is sad. But he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, and. 
Paul's ministry is a ministry that every man serving God in ministry should be following. It should line up with Paul's ministry. And when they have their own ministry apart from Paul, I know Paul told Timothy, thy ministry, but Timothy's ministry is supposed to line up with, with what Paul said ministry is supposed to be. That's what those letters were, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Okay, These were to men in ministry. Okay. Paul is saying this is how it's supposed to be. Everyone's ministry is supposed to line up with it. If you're making full proof of thy ministry. The Bible doesn't say full-time ministry, but it says making full proof of thy ministry. But what we call, so we call it full-time ministry, but it's a man who gives his life to God in ministry. It's his whole life. And needs to line up with it, this book. Okay. 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. We hear that from Paul. Follow me. I'm going to set the example. I'm going to give you the words uh, that God gives me to give to you. And we have them now. It's all written down. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now be careful when people try to get you back into the Old Testament, the, the Gospels, when they say, see, we're supposed to be followers of Christ. No, it says, be ye followers of me, Paul, as I, Paul, am of Christ. If you're following Paul, you are following Christ. Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. Today, the time of the Gentiles, that's what this time period's called, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, is called the time of the Gentiles. We're supposed to be doing things the way Jesus re revealed to Paul. Because he's the apostle to the Gentiles appointed by Jesus Christ. Some people will try to skip Paul altogether and get you back under different dispensations and get you all messed up. Remember, all throughout the scriptures we can learn instruction in righteousness, but the doctrines are going to be found in the Pauline epistle. And I know someone's going to say, well, that's heresy. That's a, you're a Paulinian. Remember, I've caught brethren that have mistaken instruction and righteousness for doctrine. Now, doctrine is a teaching. Instruction and righteousness is a teaching. What's the difference? Instruction and righteousness is teaching how to be right in God's eyes, and you can learn how, to be, how, how it's important to be right in God's eyes throughout the whole Bible. And when it comes to instruction, righteousness, sanctification, what's right, what's sin, and what's not, we can learn that throughout the whole Bible. So a lot of it overlaps. Okay, murder is still a sin, even today. Okay, bearing false witness is a sin today. Okay. But doctrines are teaching that's just for the time of the Gentiles. A doctrine is a teaching that's just for specific dispensation. Is there doctrine throughout the whole Bible? Absolutely. The Garden of Eden, what's the doctrine there? Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and only eat from the tree of life, and you will have eternal life. You'll be right with God, and you have eternal life. That's the doctrine. But is that doctrine for us today? No. Uh, in the Old Testament, Moses, uh, they had uh, or Abraham, uh, he had circumcision. Is that for us today? That's doctrine. No. Okay. Um, when Moses came around, uh, they started uh, building the temple, and then you had the priests had to go to the temple, a physical temple, a physical priesthood, and had a way of doing things. That's doctrine. But is that doctrine for us today? No. So the doctrine for today, without going off too much on it, is the gospel. Uh, we call it eternal security, but being sealed into the day of redemption, what the Bible uses, sealed into the day of redemption, that you may know you have eternal life, that once you're saved, you are sealed. And the only person that can break that seal is Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, the Godhead. And then how the body of Christ is supposed to be ran today. Ordained elders, bishops, deacons all the different gifts that's within the body of Christ, how those gifts are supposed to be used properly. These are doctrine, that's a doctrine. How the church is supposed to operate today, the body of Christ, is also another doctrine. Okay. But we're supposed to be followers of Paul, and you get people that say, well, that's just, that's a heretical teaching, you're a Paulinian, you're a Paulinian. Paul said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, appointed by Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the traditions which you received of us. Paul and the men that were with him in ministry. Verse 7. For yourselves know how we ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, 
but wrought with labor, but wrought with labor and travel night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Okay? You're to follow Paul when it comes to the, the how the ministry is supposed to work and when it comes to you know the gospel. The gospel is revealed to Paul. But Paul's also saying we're all supposed to set an example for it. Not just the ministry and, and the gospel, but living a life of Christ. We're all supposed to be a living witness. Not just a verbal witness, a living witness that we belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. We are supposed to be holier than the lost world. We're supposed to be cleaner than the hot lost world. We're supposed to be right in God's eyes. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. That's why we have a perfect written word. Okay. Which you received us. For yourselves know that we... Okay, I already read that. Okay. Um, but you, we're supposed to follow Paul when it comes to the gospel and the doctrines. Instruction righteous all throughout the Bible. And we're supposed to follow, set examples for one another to follow. Mainly the elder men are supposed to set examples for the younger men in ministry. And the elder women are supposed to set examples for the younger men in ministry. But Paul says, yet all of us are supposed to be accountable one to another. We we're supposed to be in subjection one to another. But we're supposed to be accountable to each other. According to this, that we're living up to these standards. And if we're not, true love for a brother in Christ is to get them back in the Word of God and get them back up to meeting these standards when it comes to living the life of Christ. Not for salvation. Remember, we can't earn salvation. Okay? We can't earn it. It's a gift. It's a free gift. Okay? But when you get saved and born again, God saves you. You belong to Him. Paul says you're bought with a price. You're not your own. You present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Okay. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk as you should have us for an example. Why is it so important that we're walking God's way and doing things God's way through Paul? He's following us, Paul. He taught Timothy, Titus, Silas, uh, you know, some of the apostles. You had uh, other people like Barnabas before he fell away. Okay? Us, as an example, why is it so important that we're setting the example and our example lines up with this book? Verse 18, For many walk their works. Walk is their works. Of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. I'll give you a good example of that. I put a challenge to some of these easy believers, and I said, listen, the Bible doesn't say free grace. It doesn't say free grace anywhere in the Bible. I challenged them, can you please say it the Bible way? They couldn't do it. They cannot preach the word as it is, because it doesn't tell them what they want to hear. They want a repentless gospel that's a no-change-life gospel so they can continue in their sin and wickedness. They don't have to give their life to Jesus Christ at the cross. The old man doesn't have to be dead and buried, and that's what they want. They want to continue in their sin. They're not sorry for sinning against God. They're liars. But I just put out that simple challenge. I wasn't telling them they're 100% wrong. I just said, listen, can't, why can't you say it the Bible way? And you know what? I got hammered for over four hours. They, had, they took a four-hour gossip video to try to prove me wrong, and they never did. Chapter and verse. It's not there. And you know what? They don't care that it's there. Not there. If it was there, I'd have to abide by it. They don't care that it's not there. Okay. And they clearly showed it. What are they? The enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because their walk, their works, they say, I don't care what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, supposedly. You know, he did it for the whole world, but I'm talking about them personally. I can say personally that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And the blood that was shed was God the Father's blood, not a separate God the Son's blood, but God the Father's blood was shed on the cross that washed away my sins. They can't. They can try, but it doesn't mean anything. Why? Because their life says, I don't care what Jesus did. Their life is, my life is my own. I'm not sorry. 
I don't, I'm not sorry for, for sinning against God. Remember what God, the true biblical repentance is? It's God, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Sorrow towards God. For what? For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Like the wages of sin is death and all that. But you have these people, Paul's like saying, hey, you've got some false converts out there. False brethren, like the people that came in Galatia with good words and fair speeches, bewitching them. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. If anybody preaches any other gospel than the gospel that the Bible teaches, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, and after God saves you, the power of the gospel is the new birth, the new life, the new creature in Christ Jesus, the new man. And they're against the new man, they're against repentance, they're against even prayer as it applies to salvation. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They're the final authority, not the word of God. They are the final authority, not the word of God. I always point at me because of the flesh. I'm not the final authority. People like to be the final authority. They like to think that they usurp the authority of the scriptures whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay. Once again, all through the Pauline epistle, Paul makes it a point to say that, the, that he's the apostle to the Gentiles, therefore the body of Christ is to follow him. He also states men in ministry, elders in the church, should set good examples for younger and everyone to follow. You know when I said, in my early walk with the Lord, you know when I got in the most trouble with the flesh okay, and worldliness? When I thought nobody was watching. That's the danger of online ministries, just being 100% online. Nobody's around watching you to hold you accountable to the Word of God. We need to get back to doing house church. I don't think it'll happen, but I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to be ready to do it. If, some, if the brethren end up moving out here, or I get a call to go somewhere else to be part of a house church, I'll do it on a heartbeat, because that's what we desperately need today. The brethren coming together so we can be accountable one to another. What's the number, like I said, what's the number one uh, environment where you tend to fall away, start doubting the Word of God and fall away? When Satan can get you one-on-one. -on -one. When you think you're alone and nobody's watching. No brethren looking at you and how you're living and what you're doing to see if, hey, to, catch, to hold you accountable. Right. That's why we need that. We desperately need the house churches. We need to come together. But today we're so spread out, that might be God's will because the, we're in the last days. We might be caught up any day soon. But when you follow a man in ministry, remember this. Pause the video, and because we're, we're like going through a lot of time here. Pause the video, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, read verse 1 through 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 23. Go ahead and pause it and read it. But he talks about how, verse 6, I have planted, Apollos swallowed, but God gave the increase. God needs to get all the glory, and it's God who we follow and who we serve. So then neither is he that planteth anything, even though people think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. They think there's something when they're nothing. Neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We're supposed to be one. All one in Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be striving together for the gospel. We're supposed to be working together. But today it just seems like everyone's every man for himself in ministry. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And you keep reading, okay? And it talks about where each individually need to there's our individual walk with the Lord, and then there's us coming together in fellowship, making sure that everyone's walking right according to the Lord. Helping each other walk that right, the foundation that they're laying, the works that they're laying down, that they're going to have to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ when we get caught up. Okay? And what gets me in this is when you get down to verse uh, 21, it says, Therefore let no man glory in men. There it is again. Let no man glory in men. We're not supposed to be a respecter of persons. We're not supposed to hold a man above our Lord and Savior in his perfect written word. But you see that all, all through today. People just hold it up and hold it up. I mean, we're supposed to be, I'm kind of trying to move this along a little bit, we're supposed to be of the same mind, um, and that mind is Christ. We're supposed to be of the same mind. Right? We're all supposed to be on the same page. 
But what happens? What causes division? So-and-so over here is teaching this. So-and-so over here is teaching that. So-and-so over there is teaching this. And the Word of God says something completely different than they, they say. But some people are of Him, so they're going to stick with Him. Some people are of them, they're going to stick with Him. Some people are of this person over here. And you can have this person over here that actually lines up with the book. I'm not. I'm following this ministry and learning from him, but I'm not of him. That's why I go to the book. He's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. The book is right. That's someone who puts the book first. But you got all these people, that's what's causing division in the body of Christ. We're not all of the same mind, because that mind isn't in Christ. That mind is so-and-so. This mind is that person, the mind of that person. My feelings, I think, this is what I would have done, and, and Baba... What does the Word of God say? Romans 12, 16 says, Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but contend, but consent to men of low estate. Not Mind not high things. You know, when people come in with nice suit and ties, and might, they look like they're something, like those men that came in Galatia that bewitched them, and they held them up the way Barnabas was looking at Mark, whose surname was John. For some reason, he was held up higher. Men of high consent... Of high things, might not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Make sure you're looking at the spiritual, not just the physical. Remember the Bible says, judge not on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. This is where our judgment lies, by the Holy Spirit. It's spiritual. Okay. Sometimes it, the spiritual reflects in the physical, like the sin and wickedness. You see someone in sin and wickedness, it's... It's safe to say their walk is not their, their walk with the Lord has gotten off track. They're not walking with the Lord. You need to go talk to them. Okay? But the judgment that's spiritual is you can see a brother in Christ that's fallen away. I just got finished talking about the Christ. Two steps forward, one step back, you're dealing with the brother in Christ. Someone who does a 180, at, supposedly at salvation, they do a 180 from the direction that God said you're supposed to go, they do a 180 and take off and continue going the direction they were going before they got saved. You're not dealing with someone who's, who's saved. You're dealing with a false convert. Two steps forward, they backslide a step. Two steps forward, they backslide a step. What is that? They're still moving forward. Some are struggling hardcore. Some can make it 50 steps before backsliding a step. We've all slid back a step from time to time. I do. But it's very rare. I do more steps forward than I do back in my you know, mature days as a Christian, when you mature as a Christian. But when I first got saved, sometimes it was one step forward, one step back. One step forward, one step back. Two steps forward, praise the Lord, now I'm gaining ground. One step back. Two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, one step... But they're still moving forward. There's a changed life. When you have someone with no changed life, they still look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, defend their sin and worldliness and adding to this book and ignoring what the book actually says, you're not dealing with someone who's saved. Okay, they're not of the same mind, the same judgment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10, did we read that one? Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same things and that there be no division among you. Okay, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. What causes division? When people start having their own opinions and their own feelings and their own way of doing things apart from the Scripture. And oftentimes apart from each other. Philippians 4.2 says, I beseech Eurydice, Eurodias, 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 I'm sorry, Eurodias. I beseech Eurodias and beseech, um, Synth, I can't pronounce that, Synth, that they be of the same mind in the Lord, in the Lord. Turn to Corinthians 2.6. Here's a long one. 1 Corinthians 2.6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, the wisdom comes from here, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even in the hidden wisdom, which God ordained from the world, before the world, unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's talking about how we get saved. God had that planned from the very beginning. Verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by the things which, 
by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. The world wants respect to a person. The world wants people to worship down here. They want praise of men down here, and they want to find some guy they can lift up and praise and worship. That's not Jesus Christ. Not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by, of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. What's the natural man? Carnally minded and walking after the flesh. Romans chapter 8, if you ever want to go read that sometimes. What's the time of somebody who's got the Spirit of God in them? They're, they're spiritually minded, capital S spiritually minded, walking after the capital S Spirit. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I mean, you deal with these people that are part of the easy believism, and you try to tell them that it's not faith alone and everything. They just don't get what's the big deal about me adding to the scriptures and subtracting from the scriptures. There's no big. They're the natural man. The natural man receiveth not. Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to get truly saved and born again after the true plan of salvation, of repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Then you get the Holy Spirit. Then you can understand why it's so important we don't add to this book or subtract from this book. Now some brethren start getting flesh. They start trying to res resurrect the old man. They start holding sin in their heart. And they start, you know, the Holy Spirit sets back and goes, you get convicted, you ignore the Holy Spirit. You can start making a mess of this Bible as a saved person, but that's because you're trying to go back to being the, like the old man. You're trying to go back to being the natural man. And anyone who's truly saved and born again, we know that I've failed the Lord sometimes, trying to backtrack, well, two steps forward, one step back. We're miserable, we're convicted, and our heartfelt desire is we, we shouldn't have done it, and I, I don't really want to do it, but I gave in to my flesh, I gave in to the world. I listened to the enemy and his ministers, you know, the three enemies, Satan and, you know, the world and the flesh. It's my fault, oh Lord, I'm miserable. My walk with you is hurting. My prayer life is hurting. My Bible reading life is hurting. My fellowship life is hurting. Verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Talking about the natural man. But we, those who are saved and born again, have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to be working together, brothers of Christ. We do not hold one man above another. We hold this book above every man. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. No, not the mind of so-and-so that I follow, or the mind of this so-and-so. I'm of so-and-so. I'm of Paul. I'm of Paulus. I'm of Cephas. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, receive Jesus Christ the Lord, and walk ye in him. We can follow ministries, follow good teachings that line up with the book, but the book is the final authority, and we're supposed to walk in the Lord. He's the number one person that we're of. We're all at one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. Rude and built up in him, established in the faith as, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That verse there, Colossians 2.8, is the number one verse that really takes a lot of brethren in ministry down. They start getting into philosophy. Traditions, especially in the battle building system, philosophy, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. Some of the men online on YouTube have done it, have fallen into that trap. And what happens? They're not after Christ. They're not preaching this. And when they claim to be preaching this, are they actually lining up with this? Some brethren are, but some brethren have lost their way. I've just seen that verse take so many people down. And I keep praying, pray for me, pray for men in ministry that... That verse, those of us who are still standing, that verse doesn't take us down. We don't get spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. 
after the traditions of men. We don't get stuck in the traditions of men or the rudiments of the world. The rudiments of the world, covetousness, idolatry, respect of persons, love of money. And I could go on and on the whole list that you see that really get affect men in ministry. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, not the man, we've read this before, but not the man of, of Philip Newton, not the man of whoever it is you watch, Peter Ruckman, not the man of, the man of God. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. We're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished into all good works. That's why we have a final authority, the Word of God. It's always been the final authority throughout the whole Bible. The Word of God is the final authority. Okay? Not the words of men. The Holy Scriptures are where we are to line up. Not the, the man so-and-so. Real quick, I, I know this has been long. We're almost at the end. I used to say so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that when I first got saved. I did. I was like, oh... Peter Ruckman said this, and Brian Denlinger said this, and 33rd Book said that. And I remember hearing Sam Gibbs say this over here. Oh, yeah, and David Daniels said that. And someone corrected me, a brother corrected me, because I would say so-and-so said, and I'd read the scripture. A teaching, a good, solid teaching. And I was excited. I was, I was lied to my whole life. I was so excited about learning the Word of God. I have the Word of God. I believe it. I have it in my hands. Now I want to learn it. Now I want to study it. I want to hide it in my heart and live it. I got a correction. I was, I, it's like I was following someone's ministry, but I was of them. If I kept saying, they say, they say, they say, they say, I was of them. I'm of Apollos. I'm of, of uh, Paul. I'm of Cephas. It took a correction from a brother in Christ to start saying, the word of God says this. Let that sink in, because some of you may, might be making the same mistake I used to do. Well, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that. You know what the danger is of, of falling, doing that? You know why people love saying so-and-so said this instead of saying thus saith the Lord? The Word of God says this. A. It is easier to say so-and-so said this than the Word of God. Why? Because if you say something wrong, you are not wrong. It was so-and-so. Ever notice that with some people? When you actually go, well, it really wasn't me that said it, it was so-and-so. But you were saying, thus saith the Lord. You were talking about the Bible teaches, but you were saying so-and-so said it. So they don't, take any, they don't take any credit for being wrong. They just bl blame the so-and-so. That way, I'm never wrong. It's always so-and-so. If he's right, then okay. If he's wrong, I'm never wrong. Whereas if you say the Word of God says this and it does not, you have to admit you're the wrong one. Or, with some brethren, you can dig your heels in and be prideful and keep trying to pervert the scriptures to get it to say what you want it to say. I've seen that happen too. But for the most part, if you're a King James Bible believer, you love the Lord, you love His Word, if I say something the Word doesn't say, I have to drop my... Hopefully I don't have pride and ego, but you know what I'm saying? I have to actually humble myself and say, I am wrong. But if you're just saying so-and-so said it, it wasn't me that was wrong. He's the one that said it. Okay. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, let, yea, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings, and mightst overcome them when thou art judged. That's what I'm saying, let God be true, and every man a liar. Now, I'm not saying I'm a purposely lying, but I'm saying, remember what I said? Rule number one, this book is always right, let God be true. Rule number two, if this man's wrong, and he can be sometimes, refer to rule number one, let God be true. Okay. And when, when I say something that goes against the word, I'm not purposely lying, but for this verse, but let every man be a liar. The Bible says, add thou not to his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. What this is talking about, when we're talking about the word, is, is when we tend to add to this word, subtract from the word, we end up lying to people. Ignorantly, sometimes, and sometimes intentionally. I've seen people do it intentionally. They'll purposely leave out verses. They'll purposely try to play the word games where they try to change the words that God said and try to act like they're not changing the word of God when they are. 
Let God be true and every man of liars is written that thou mayest be justified in the sayings and might overcome them when, when thou art judged. Here's B, first reason. For B, number two, B. It seems to be easier to say so-and-so said this and let them do all the heavy lifting. Remember what the Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. A lot of people get to be a respecter of persons, and I'm of this person because they tell you what they want to hear, but sometimes it could be something as simple as laziness. I'm of him, and I'm going to let him do all the work. And that way, when he's wrong, it's him that's wrong, not me. But I'm going to let him do all the work. It seems easier to say, so-and-so said this, and let him do all the heavy lifting, than for you to do the than for you to be a Brian, than for you to do the heavy lifting. Not that this is heavy, but it takes work. It takes time to study the Word of God. It takes time. I keep telling you, brothers and Christ, start the day with the Word of God and end the day with the Word of God. Make sure you're reading this book every day. Start your day with it. End your day with it. Start your day with prayer as you're reading this book. Talk with the Lord as you're reading this book. Talk with the Lord at the end of the day. Talk to Him about your day, and then end your day with the Word of God. But for you to be a Brian and check the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. Remember in Acts 17.10, you don't have to turn there, but this is where we get about the Bereans. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, if they were a respecter of persons, they would have said, well, Paul says it, that's good enough for me. I don't want to do any work. I don't want to do any heavy lifting. Back then, they had scrolls. And for, like each chapter might have been a huge scroll. They might have been able to have several chapters on a scroll. It wasn't a nice book that has tabs where we can go all through the Bible. They didn't have nice programs on here where you do sword searchers and everything. Or uh, we have um, even the book, I forgot what it's called, um, a concordance. I've got a book over there that's a physical book concordance where it's a lot harder, but still a lot easier than back then. Having to look things up. All right? They did the heavy lifting. Why? Because they wanted to be right with God. Not with Paul, with God. That's how you're supposed to be. Are you being that way, brother, says Christ? Or are you falling in the same trap that Aaron did and you start being a respecter of persons and you start going down a wrong path? You start turning from this book. The flesh is starting to get the better of you because the person you follow is getting fleshly. The world's getting the best of you because the person you're following is getting worldly. He'd rather preach the world than the Word. And the third enemy is Satan and his enemies. Are you starting to fall into doctrines of devils? False teachings. People get you to turn on the proper teachings of this book. I've seen brethren turn away from proper teachings. Man. Remember, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. and all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. So, what, so yet, what is another thing that can get in your way of acknowledging God in all your ways? What gets in the way of this being your final authority, and taking this and hiding it in your heart and living it, and trusting the Lord with the life around you, no matter what happens, you're trusting the Lord because you're doing things God's way. What gets in the way of that? One of the biggest things I see getting in the way of that with the brethren today is respecter of persons. Like Aaron, he became a respecter of persons. He wouldn't stand up for God and for what was right. He went along with what so-and-so did, uh, what Moses did, because I'm of Moses. And Aaron's got to remember that God is God. He comes first. Right. Brother says Christ, is God coming first in your life? Is His Word coming first? One of the easiest tests is, do you start your day with the Word of God? And end your day with the Word of God and prayer? I have a brother in Christ that hit me up. The first thing I hit him up is, are you starting? Because he's starting to, he's like backsliding and he's having trouble with the world and, and all this stuff. And he's starting to feel like, you know, he's backed into a corner like, you know, he doesn't know what to do. First thing I asked him was, is, have you been staying in the Word of God every morning? And and prayer, and ending your day with the Word of God, and he's like, no brother, I haven't. I really haven't. This has the solution to all your problems, brother Jesus Christ. This is the solution to all your problems. So we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. 
Stick with the word. Stay in prayer. And pray, uh, pray for me as I'm praying for you, Brother Sis Christ. And I'll see you in the next video.